All right, uh, welcome everybody. I think it's 11.04, let's get started. We have about 60 people already joined uh, and still counting. Uh, I'll shortly introduce um, the uh, panel of this uh, webinar, um, but maybe first take two minutes uh, uh, to introduce myself. So my name is Jelle Vastert. Um, very happy to be here today to host this session about a topic dear to my heart. Uh, we're going to talk today about the progress of matching EV charging with um, with the marginal cost of renewables. Um, I'm on the board of Jetlix. Uh, I have about 12 years of experience in uh, EV charging. Uh, I spent five years at Tesla, set up the um, European supercharger team and then led charging globally for about two and a half years. Uh, and although I had a, um, a, a big focus on uh, building out fast charger uh, networks. Uh, I also set first row on the customer preference for um, for home and work charging, uh, and and realized very early on that um, that this kind of charging is not only uh, a customer preference and the easiest way for customers to charge, but also um, a flexible way of charging because parking time is always or almost always longer than charging times. So or there's a lot of flexibility, uh, and we said seven eight years ago like charging should actually be for free. Uh, if you charge at uh, certain times. Um, we've come a long way. Uh, I think uh, today we have a, a wide range of institutions uh, that have been linking uh, the time of charging uh, to very competitive tariffs. Uh, obviously, we've also come a long way in uh, producing renewable energy, uh, solar and wind now marginal cost at, at just a few cents. Uh, and uh, and obviously with a lot of intermittency. So when um, when uh, demand and supply don't match, you could even get paid uh, to get charged. Uh, very excited to talk about this topic today. I think it's a it's a super big lever in accelerating the transition to EVs. Uh, and as people get more cons co cost conscious, which will happen in the next couple of years, uh, I think this is a super big driver um, that could accelerate the whole industry. Uh, so without uh, further ado, let me introduce uh, the panel of today and then let's also talk a little bit about the outline. Um, so on behalf of uh, of Jetlix, and we also have Jorg here, but I'd uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Ty Smits, uh, a, a product developer at Ineco, but also uh, very early days involved in, uh, I think, setting up uh, Jetlix, which is kind of a spin out of Ineco. Um, a, a passionate, uh, very passionate about uh, this topic. I think he sits pretty close to uh, customers, uh, and um, and although he's been in the sector for a long time, uh, I think this year is really exciting for him. Then we also have Jacob Dalton of Tibber, uh, very progressive energy retailer in the Nordics. Uh, ha ha happy to have you here, uh, Jacob. Uh, Jacob is the head of uh, trading, uh, and 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 also I think one of the main drivers in Tibber's uh, demand flexibility vision. Then uh, Michael Clark. Uh, an ex-colleague with Tesla, uh, where he, uh, I think, started his career, then went to Porsche, is now at NIO, where he's the lead product manager for charging. Um, and uh, and he will talk about uh, the uh, the potential for these tariffs also for uh, for NIO customers and what they've been doing uh, so far. Uh, then Jorg is here, uh, CBO and co-founder at Jetlix, uh, responsible for engagement with mobility and energy uh, partners and a big driver to uh, Jetlix growth also internationally. Uh, and then uh, Alex Schock, who I had the pleasure to work with at Tesla, and we've been following each other since that time. He has been head of uh, flexibility and electrification at Octopus for the last couple of years um, and have, has developed uh, and brought to market the next generation of uh, products and technology that make it easier and more economic for EV drivers um, to, to charge. And then last but not least, uh, Geert Janssen, uh, a director at NG Belgium, who recently introduced uh, uh, Terrace, so he has been supported the development of the NG Smart App uh, and launched uh, a number of new energy products specifically for EV owners. Uh, welcome to the whole uh, group. Uh, we will have uh, kind of two, maybe three uh, sections. So we wanted to give everybody on the panel the uh, opportunity to introduce themselves and to specifically talk about, dive right into how do they connect uh, their Smart Terrace uh, set up a VPP and offer something uh, in this field to customers. So this is not uh, about company presentations, but really about uh, specific uh, the specific topics, smart terrace and VPP. Uh, and then uh, we're probably going to take three to five minutes each. 
uh, then it's back over to me. Um, we've prepared a number of questions and we'll ask the panel uh, to answer uh, some of these questions. Uh, in the meantime, I think you can also um, ask your own questions uh, and, and we'll pick and choose at the end of the session and then we'll do a short ramp up. Uh, this was set out to be kind of an hour session, uh, nice, short and snappy. We might overrun a little bit, but we'll still try to keep it um, uh, rather short uh, also to give you enough time in the day to make progress on uh, on, on important topics. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I think um, uh, we wanted to ask Alex uh, as the first one to um, introduce himself and then talk a little bit about what uh, Octopus is up to. Over to you, Alex. Bruno, can you unmute uh, Alex? I think uh, you can do it yourself, Alex. <laughs> Otherwise, while Alex is finding his unmute uh, button, uh, maybe maybe it's heard. I know we've we've uh, tested and heard your voice. Maybe we should switch to you, and then uh, in the background, Alex can uh, can maybe. Reconnect. Geert, can you? Uh... Yes, no problem. Uh, so, uh, if you then switch to the next slide, uh, uh, what uh, at NG, what we started from, of course, is uh, that we uh, looked at what are the customer needs, and uh, we encountered three types of problems that uh, EV drivers uh, were having. Uh, the first one is uh, they don't know how much charging really costs them. They know what their energy bill as a total of their home is, but they don't know what the charging exactly costs them. Secondly, uh, that uh, they don't know how to do it in the cheapest way because it's a lot of hassle and how can we uh, help them to do it in a cheaper way to charge. Uh, and then the third one would be, uh, yeah, I'm I want to be sure that my car is ready and full uh, at the time that I want it. And with these problems, we looked at the Belgian market. And uh, of course, the Belgian market is quite complex. We have uh, having three uh, different regions with three different regulators and then a federal regulator. And the rollout of the smart uh, digital meters is totally different in the three regions. Uh, being in Flanders, where we will reach 80% by end of next year, but in Wallonia and Brussels, uh, they still have to start. Uh, given that context, uh, we wanted to have a solution for EV drivers that was applicable to the whole of Belgium. Uh, and not only to people with a digital meter, where we are still in rollout phase. So that's, uh, if you go down to the next slide, uh, so that's why we created the, the drive product and the drive product is a, is a combination of a commodity element and a, a service element. And for the service element, of course, uh, we looked at Jetlix uh, to integrate the services we, that answer to the real customer needs that I, I mentioned just before. On the commodity side, uh, since we uh, say we want to deliver a product for you don't see the slides. Is it a problem only at my side or uh, is does everybody have a problem? I can see them. I can see them too. Uh, but uh, so uh, on the commodity side, uh, since we don't want to only focus on people uh, with a digital meter, where you can then uh, put forward uh, more advanced solutions like time of use or digital uh, dynamic tariff, uh, we wanted to have first a product that uh, would cover the whole market. So we uh, stay with the classical peak of peak where we uh, lowered the off peak uh, rate uh, to the maximum amount uh, and where we integrated uh, since they are in the mindset of uh, being conscious to, uh, to our environment that uh, this uh, energy that they consume would be fully Belgian green. On the other hand, uh, we integrated the service of Jetlix, 
uh, in uh, or white labeled app, uh, the drive app that is uh, part of this total package, uh, where uh, of course they can charge them at the most advantages uh, in the most advantages way uh, in off peak. Uh, where they uh, also get a reward uh, uh, for uh, their smart charging uh, and we pay 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, it, given the Belgian flexibility market, etc., uh, uh, that's what, what we uh, came out of. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, they have the insight in their charging sessions and uh, they can easily plan the sessions as, uh, as part of the functionality. So this totally integrated offer uh, is on the Belgian market for our EV drivers. But then uh, we said, OK, do we now cover all the EV drivers uh, in the market? And that's the next slide uh, where we say, OK, if we move there, okay. So in uh, in the Belgian market, if we look at the the needs of our EV drivers, uh, we say no. Uh, uh, it's not just about the tariff. It's also uh, what type of tariff do you really want? And so there uh, we say okay. There is part of people that will want full security. Certainly, given the uh, the recent uh, evolution in the in the markets. Uh, so there they have the option to go for a one year fixed uh, drive contract, but other people want to just uh, follow the market in a normal way. So they have a monthly adapted variable tariff in the drive contract with all the services included. But of course, uh, we see uh, upcoming also in Belgium uh, that uh, more and more people are also looking at uh, I want to follow the real market uh, in in real time. So uh, there we offer the dynamic tariff with an hourly variable rate, uh, which also incorporates, of course, within the service of the drive app uh, in order to automate the steering for their charging. So that's the in that way we have a tariff that suits every type of EV driver in Belgium. And uh, in that way, we tackle uh, the market at this moment. Of course, this will evolve when the market uh, evolves and gets more and more mature, uh, where we will then also introduce more adapted and uh, other types of tariffs. Thanks. Thanks, Heer. Great overview. Which is the most uh, uh, popular one of the three? The drive fixed. Drive fixed. Mm. OK, good to know. Um, Let's uh, immediately switch. Maybe we can switch back to Alex, see if that works. You're still on mute. No, no, Thank you're you not. for having me. OK, great. I Alex. always, always, always enjoy uh, participating in a in a Jetlix webinar. Um, and I apologize for my uh, slight technical challenges. Um, I will just start sharing my screen and um, I want to talk to you about um, Intelligent Octopus Go. Uh, so within Octopus, we have uh, have had a variety of smart tariffs um, enabled by by smart meter, um, you know, with a fundamental enablement by through smart meters uh, since 2018, actually. Um, and uh, you know, a wide variety of, of tariffs, but th this I think is the most exciting one. Um, and it's exciting because it's, you know, it's, it's helping customers. Um, it's harnessing uh, the, 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 the demand growth that comes with electrification of transport. But it's, you know, it's fundamentally indexed on customers because we can all build the best tech in the world and uh, you know the best monetization strategies if customers don't trust the supplier or the provider of this service and if there is not a massive over indexing on customers then you will never at least my opinion is you will never move out of an early adopter um, phase into mass market so intelligent octopus go is a is a smart tariff that is integrated into a, uh, a smart charging capability powered by uh, by the Octopus Kraken uh, platform. Um, and the, the value propositions are super simple. You can save over 600 pounds uh, a year, uh, assuming you know uh, 10, uh, 
uh, 15,000 kilometers of driving, for example, a year on average, um, by simply switching this tariff, the all the whole tariff switch, um, including setting up and connecting to either your car or your charger takes place in the Octopus app. And the 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 customers are 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 kind of are fully wrapped in a an, with a knowledgeable um, and and highly kind of uh, comp, uh, competent uh, customer service team who can solve any of their kind of questions, whether it's about you know what's the best tariff for them, um, billing questions or charging questions. Yeah, this this over index, I'd say it's not an over index. This 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 significant focus on simplicity is, I think, what is at the core of um, of the success because this this tariff now is, or this kind of this product is launched in has been launched in in the UK since um, about uh, I think about a year, maybe a little bit over a year, and in that period of time, it's uh, already grown to a hundred thousand EVs. So we have a 100,000 um, EVs that are controlled, optimized, uh, and uh, dispatched every day um, for, uh, for customers. Um, but what you see here are really basically the only three screens within the Octopus app that the customer ever kind of needs to go to. So the first is setting up, uh, you know, setting themselves up and switching to this tariff, which includes connecting to their, uh, to their device. Uh, this takes about five minutes. So during the course of this webinar, we will have somewhere between uh, 50 to 100 new customers switching onto Intelligent Octopus, um, doing it all uh, from the comfort of their of their mobile app without any kind of incremental changes. Uh, and then only two inputs, right? The when they want uh, when they want their car ready by and, and what state of charge and then their bespoke charging schedule is simply and easily communicated to them and they can always opt out. They can always, uh, you know, override the charge schedule and charge when they want and uh, they can start and stop. You know, they can enable or disable smart charging um, very easily as well, because at the end of the day, uh, customer control and customer uh, you know, customer needs need to be at the center of any uh, tariff, uh, um, especially when it comes to then managing uh, very important uh, things to people's lives, uh, such as their mobility needs. Um, that's not to say that there isn't a bunch of complexity that is managed in the background, um, because that you know this is a a kind of very complex set optimization question of like, how do we actually scale this? How do we make sure that every single car is charging in a uh, you know, customer centric needs way, whilst also uh, the most uh, cost effective way, helping re reduce congestion at both distribution and transmission, uh, participating in other services. So you can see that it is, there's a lot of complexity in the background, but for the customer, the customer only sees what you know the very simple inputs and has a guaranteed uh, savings for them because um, at scale and doing this for hundreds of thousands of customers it's it's all about managing that risk and that and the commercial opportunity does not you know pushing that through to the consumer in 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 my view is is not a recipe for success in the long term and so I think I will leave you with. Um, customer needs are always king. You need to manage a complex set of trading and uh, input parameters and optimization challenges in the background, um, but that has to be done without the customer ever being disadvantaged. Fully agree. Uh, great, great overview, Alex. Um, maybe one question. I, I know at the beginning there were some volume, uh, like, so let's say boundaries. Do you still have them? Or is it like you have this tariff uh, and then people can charge as much as they want? They can charge as much as they want. That's great. Awesome. All right. I think uh, next up is Jacob Dalton uh, from Tibber. Jacob. Hi, hoping you hear me. Uh, Can and you uh, loud and clear. You hoping you're seeing something as well. Not you, but I. We see your uh, your okay. presentation. So that's great. Okay, great. You, you don't see me. Are you supposed to see me? I'm not sure. So, uh, yeah, yeah. You will. We'll see you. As, yeah. No, the camera works as well. But okay, the great. The main screen is your presentation. Take it away. Sure. Uh, 
Yeah, Jacob uh, at Zipper here. So heading up the trading effort um, really quickly. Introduction to Zipper. Yeah, uh, digital energy retailer. Um, and what we do is offer the wholesale price directly to our users. So our users only have there's only one tariff uh, available with Zipper, and that is the day head price uh, with no profit margin. So we don't make energy. We don't make money from selling energy. It's a it's a fixed fee setup. So four euros a month for the service. We sell hardware uh, and have an e-commerce platform that users can couple heat pumps, vehicles, um, wall boxes, etc. But here in the middle, you see the hourly price essentially uh, that comes directly from the spot market with no profit margin. And then if I go to the next slide, yes. Similarly to what Alice, Alex has just discussed, yeah, it's pretty complex uh, picture in the background. On top of EV charging, we're also doing heating, smart heating, uh, batteries, doing main fuse load balancing, uh, also m managing the grid tariffs, for example, in Norway, which have uh, time of use grid tariffs. So all of a sudden it's many moving pieces that are actually beyond just the vehicle uh, that the home is, the home needs to be handled in a holistic optimization way. And that's on a that's on a local level, not to mention then how that interacts to the the portfolio level and the markets. Uh, and then we're talking about the VPP. So Tipper has half a million customers now, two hundred thousand over two hundred thousand electric vehicles connected to our platform. Uh, and yeah, it's a lot of flexibility, as you can imagine. Here is then the picture of on an aggregated level our fleet charging essentially, and you can see the price in orange and, and smart charging, simple as that is the, the lowest prices um, on an aggregate level there. So from this sense, in terms of trading, we are constrained, so to say, to the spot price. Uh, but two years ago, we, we became pre-qualified in Sweden to deliver frequency containment reserves. So that we've been doing for uh, two years on a daily basis now with the wall boxes, providing you know, both FCR N and D. There's two different types in the Nordics, and this is happening therefore in the background and essentially we're there, ready to support the system if incidents happen. Uh, and we're getting paid for that, and we're sharing that revenue with our users via today a smart charging guarantee, where we guarantee that their charging cost is 50% of the cost of the rest of the energy in the home. But this is just scratching the surface. Uh, I can't uh, give too many details, but there's there's a big leap coming uh, essentially where we're going to expose prices that aren't just the spot price. So you know, Tibur was a pioneer in many ways in terms of dynamic pricing, and we've been doing smart charging for five years. Uh, this is now standard, and it's great to, to have the industry offering smart charging as standard practice. Uh, and there's going to be the next step now is even more dynamic pricing is the direction we're going, where we can expose other signals other than the spot price and generate maximum value. Thank you. Awesome, Jacob. Thank you. Um, any indication on how long uh, we have to wait uh, for those features? Uh, there's, there's, there's some Secret uh, lucky handful of Swedish users actually, uh, maybe potentially uh, with this in their hands as of yesterday, but All right. soon. Great, around the corner. Fantastic. Um, I think the next five minutes are for uh, your uh, Jetlix. Th thanks for setting this up, uh, Jorg. No problem. Um... Waiting for the slide to appear right there. Yeah, so um, thank, thanks for helping uh, Jelle. Also again, on behalf of Jetlex, uh, a warm welcome to all the presenters and all the attendees. Uh, we have car VMs, DSOs, uh, energy utilities, of course, charge point manufacturers, everybody in the ecosystem uh, is basically here. Jetlex is on a mission. We want to enable zero emission charging for millions of EVs across all continents. Um, this started many years ago. 
back in the days with you, Yella, uh, even Alex was, was somewhere around uh, Thais, where we were perhaps playing around with a couple of Teslas. But uh, uh, yeah, now this is really heading to something. Uh, we can't do this on our own. Um, uh, so we enable apps or via API other apps to really scale this across. Um, we're still missing a few continents. Um, so if, ever, if somebody from outside of Europe uh, is interested, do call us. Um, uh, but we're definitely on our way and can do that, of course, with the help of uh, with the distribution power, proposition power of, of, of some of the people here in, here in the room today. Um, and indeed, it's crucial to have the right customer proposition and how and, and in a way blend all the technologies of VPP steering optimization into something that can really scale. So I really hope that uh, the discussion today inspires the industry people uh, in, in in these great initiatives. We as Jetlix, go to the next slide. We as Jetlix are just a humble technology provider that 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 has a Swiss Army knife that can help you with a range of uh, what we would call flexibility use cases, grid services, portfolio steering, solar tariffs, <clears throat> even DSO signals. Uh, we support them all, not always all together. Uh, that is perhaps the dream uh, in, in, the, in the future when, when you really can get charging to, 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 to get not only zero emissions, but also zero cost. That would be, uh, that would be another ambition. <laughs> Now that a platform provides um, a really a Swiss army knife to, to handle uh, the most used. I come from the Netherlands. It happens to be that we're number one in. Audio dropped. Let me continue here. Can you still hear me, Jelle? I can still hear you. You were breaking up a yep. little bit. Yeah. So we provide a Swiss Army knife to to make sure that the most relevant use case in the, in the territory of market for that particular EV driver is is uh, supported. That could be solar. That could be uh, support for tariffs. That could be support for tariffs. Um, and uh, yeah, that's something we try to achieve. We have all kinds of nifty tools, uh, let's say, in our platform to make that work. I'm not going to zoom into that, but in the end, those tools uh, uh, help our partners in the end to craft a, a winning proposition. And uh, this is not something in the future. I sometimes hear people saying, "When is residential flexibility taking off?" But I think all the uh, all the presenters in the in the room here today already have thousands or ten, tens of thousands of uh, EV drivers uh, connected to the initiative. Um, so we should st stop talking about. Uh, when is this coming? It is here, and 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 see how we can expand it and uh, expire it. And then I'll uh, give the word back to you, Jelle. Thanks, Jorg. And uh, we'll we'll definitely have some questions on the VPP part uh, later on. Um, I think for now, I want to give the floor to uh, Michael Clark of uh, Neo. Michael. Perfect. You can hear me and see the screen, I hope. Um, yes. I feel very honored to be invited, sort of representing the OEM perspective, uh, especially since uh, we're unfortunately still one of the few OEMs not yet uh, integrated to the Jetlix app. But uh, let me show you what we've been doing uh, in the meantime. Um, real quick, uh, NEO operates over 28 power swap stations in Europe. And uh, the reason why I want to show the map is we're sort of focused in the Nordics right now, where we, of course, have a lot of smart meters and uh, dynamic tariffs. Uh, we've performed over 40,000 swaps and have over, over 2,000 PSS worldwide. And uh, we also have a, a battery as a service. I think we don't need to, we don't own the battery, but I'm not going to get into that too much today. We're focusing on smart charging. Um, what do we consider smart charging? Um, the reason why we're interested in, in this space at all is because we have, you know, big infrastructure. We have the power up station with a 600 kilowatt grid connection, two megawatt hours of storage, three high power chargers, uh, fully connected and soon bi-directional. So power is for us a very interesting topic with a lot of uh, opportunity uh, and sort of the technology we've taken from the power swap station 
uh, to the vehicle is sort of cost optimized charging or uh, charging when the energy is cheap. And for the user, uh, this is in, in every uh, NEO vehicle. Uh, you can simply, um, yeah, go to your uh, setting screen for battery and say smart charging at this location. Uh, turn it on. We either have, you know, day night tariff or price optimized, which really does use the day ahead prices uh, to pick the cheapest hours of the day to charge. Set your uh, departure time or charge by time and we'll reach the target SOC um, by the time uh, you select it. Uh, you can also uh, do this from the app. Um, just uh, select smart charging and uh, you can sort of see the 200 meter radius that we create and every AC charging session created here will be delayed uh, for smart charging and we'll, we'll pick the cheapest hours of the day. Um, how did we do it? Um, we It was a sort of three month project. It, it didn't take a lot of time for us. We used the free to use data from MSOE. Uh, importantly, we've removed ourselves from the value chain to unlock a good user experience. So we're, we're not making money off of every uh, thing. We're not trying to push our own energy tariff. Uh, we've, we've really removed ourselves there. And as I said, we, we use the synergy with our battery swap stations as well. Um, for the user, the main benefits are it's very simple to set up and override if necessary. It's compatible with any real dynamic electri electricity tariff even the ones that sort of protect the user from extreme events, the cheapest hour of the day will usually be the same uh, anyway. And uh, we believe it's a little bit more reliable and robust than the sort of third party app solutions where you log in uh, with your user account, because in this case, it's us controlling our own car directly uh, and we have full visibility on all the other factors. In the future, you know, this is a platform we, we, we wish to expand. You know, maybe we'll do CO2 optimized charging for the customers in Germany that don't have a smart tariffs yet. Um, cloud integration with solar inverters is something that's very interesting to do sort of PV optimized charging uh, and demand response uh, is another a big one. Also, if we use sort of this vehicle centric approach to smart charging, we can also do offline. So the vehicle essentially just downloading uh, the day ahead prices while it's outside, drive into the underground garage, and we can still do smart charging even when not connected directly to the internet. The challenges we've seen, because we've launched this in, in April already, uh, is sort of infusing, uh, informing users of this function, uh, you know, reaching out uh, with the new feature is, is not always easy. And some of the cost savings in, in some Nordic uh, price regions was a little bit lower than anticipated, but just because the variation wasn't um, as big anymore as maybe it was in the last uh, years. Hopefully in the future, the variation will increase. And so the value of this kind of function will also increase. And the lessons learned and sort of feedback uh, I want to share with you is we heard, you know, keep it simple and definitely no surprises. Uh, then you lose trust and trust is harder and then easily uh, lost. So that's sort of the quick overview of a new smart charging. And uh, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Do you actually give uh, customers an indication of how much they could save on a dynamic tariff uh, charging or? We don't know the absolute prices uh, oh, yeah. that they get. So we, we we have sort of internally, we track sort of relative uh, what which should be possible. But uh, yes, we've also heard, you know, that users want so, sort of more visualization of what the charging plan is and, and how much they can actually charge. But here we just wanted to get the simplest function uh, possible into the vehicle uh, where the user actually uses it, can see it and activate it in three seconds. Um, and I think we're the first OEM to really take the smart charging seriously, bake it into the vehicle, not bake it into the, a wall box or some other like third party, but just taking responsibility and saying, yes, our cars can charge when the electricity is cheap. Great. Thanks. Um, and I think last but not least, uh, Ty Smits of Ineco. Uh, has something to share for the next five minutes. Uh, thereafter, we'll go into a Q&A session. So 
if everybody can start prepping his questions, it would be uh, would be great as well. Yeah, good day, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, uh, Jelle, for the uh, introduction uh, earlier, and thank you, Bruno, for helping me with the uh, slide. I had some technical uh, challenges uh, over here, so uh, thanks for that, and I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and talk uh, with you about uh, dynamic uh, energy contracts and the, yeah, the revolution it's bringing to the energy market. Um, so in September, as in ECO, uh, we took an exciting step forward uh, by launching our dynamic energy contract. And yeah, this, this initiative was a, a direct response to the evolving needs of our uh, customers and also the growing desire to manage uh, energy in a uh, smarter, uh, more sustainable and efficient way. And looking from a uh, customer perspective, there were three reasons for us to, to launch this uh, product. First of all, the, the cost savings. Huh? So uh, consumers can reduce their energy costs by utilizing real-time uh, rates. Uh, this allows them to shift their energy consumption to cheaper hours and, and therefore lower their energy bills. And I think also a concrete example of cost, saving, uh, cost savings comes from our uh, smart charging uh, initiative. So we use or we utilize the uh, smart charging service from uh, Jetlix and uh, the, the smart charging app in combination with a dynamic energy contract. Uh, uh, EV owners uh, can charge a car during the most cost-effective uh, uh, hours, which can result in, in significant uh, cost savings, sometimes up to several hundreds, hundreds of, of euros, of course, depending on how much you use your car and, and how much of the time you use, you would charge the, the car at home. So the, the second reason for us was that, that dynamic energy contracts uh, provide customers with uh, uh, clear price signals. Uh, enabling them to make more uh, informed choices about their consumption, about their costs. So, but we are really new to this uh, game. We have we have been live with the product for only two and a half months, and and we definitely don't have the experience as as other providers. But uh, uh, what what we what we observe now is that, and the data we collected from our customers is that our customers are already adapting uh, or are changing their uh, uh, behavior. Um, uh, we, we observe that customers are adapting by using more electricity during the less expensive periods and reducing their usage uh, during the uh, costlier times. Uh, specifically, there is a noticeable decrease in consumption during the uh, morning and evening peaks and uh, coupled with a significant uh, increase in usage during the, uh, during the afternoon. And thirdly, it, but because of sustainability, yeah, the, the use of real-time rates rates encourages uh, uh, consumers to align their energy usage with times when sustainable energy resources like sun and wind are more abundant. Um, and although we're not directly focusing on greener hours, as in giving uh, customers insights in the app, we are experimenting with, with notifications, but that that we're still exploring this area. We do get feedback from customers that they are interested in, in gaining more insight in, in when there is an abundance of uh, uh, green energy. Um, so yeah, in, in, in summary, I think energy providers have a crucial role to play here in, in, in firstly identifying uh, target audiences for whom this product is most uh, appealing and also uh, actively uh, support customers uh, to maximize the benefits to uh, dynamic energy contracts. And um, yes, yeah, for Ineco, we, we continue to gather data and insights. And our goal is to refine and perfect uh, uh, our offering. Um, and this also concludes my uh, short presentation. Uh, and I do thank you for your attention. Great, thanks guys. Uh, super clear and congrats on launching this. Um, I think very excited, uh, exciting to see uh, Ineco uh, bring this to practice. Um, so I think we're on to the next uh, session. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions uh, prepared uh, that I will ask, but uh, Bruno will also gather 
I think from uh, attendees, uh, any questions that you may have or we uh, pick and choose from. I think we have about uh, maybe 30 minutes or so for uh, for this session. Um, and uh, yeah, let's make it as lively as possible. I think what really uh, shines through, uh, through all of the uh, previous presentations, obviously cu customer focus uh, and coming up with a really simple uh, proposition. I think there were also a couple of slides that had the word VPP on it. Uh, the word aggregation uh, and word complexity. Um, under the hood, there is a bit of complexity uh, needed. Um, uh, and, and let's talk about that a little bit. So I think to, to make that also concrete to, to markets is um, like a question that we want to ask to a couple of the, um, the panelists is what markets and, and VPP products specifically uh, do you expect to be the most promising? Uh, we've heard a frequency response. Um, and this might also play out differently in, in different regions, uh, but it would be good to, to get a bit of um, yeah, a, a look under the hood uh, and, and some, um, some vision here. So maybe uh, Jacob uh, from Tibber's side, like w where do you see kind of the next frontier of, or, or um, like in setting up a VPP, what, what flexibility markets are most interesting for you? So at the moment, as we said, it's, it's FCR and there's it's a bit of a buzz around FCR uh, for many years. Uh, everyone is, especially in Sweden, um, and especially with the battery, with the home battery, some, some of the revenues that have been generated are ridiculous with paybacks of a year. Um, but I think uh, the, the political answer, sorry, I will have to give a political answer. It's, it's going to be that it depends. And we're going to put flexibility where there's most value. And I think it's going to be very, very dynamic. And that's the point. It is, it's going to change. It's going to depend on the geography. And it's going to depend on yeah, the development of the markets because everyone is rushing into FCR. There's different opinions. Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Uh, I think time will tell. We believe in the long term, it's actually local flex uh, where actors like Tipper or maybe everyone in this call because we're talking about domestic uh, flexibility that's where that's where we're going to generate the most value because yeah digging up streets is going to cost 45 billion euros or something ridiculous every year and uh, that's that's not what we should be that there's far better ways to solve that problem than digging up streets and it's local flexibility and yeah it's 2023 there's there's no need to dig up streets. One day, maybe that maybe that's the last thing we should do, not the first thing we should do. So that's my political answer. As a concept that resonates really strongly, um, and I also saw a question coming in from uh, from the audience. But is there already a market for this? I mean, that's a uh, that, yes. that that's uh, can you already uh, incentivize uh, network companies? Yes. Uh, to to maybe so prevent some of their investments. 100% uh, Nodes is one of the platforms that's quite established in the Nordics. There's also Piccolo, of course, in the UK, and then GoPax, where you are in the Netherlands. And it's same, same with FCR. I mean, I'm really glad that yours said it as well. We're well, well beyond pilot stage and proving that this is a thing. I mean, let's move beyond that discussion and just scale this technology out. It's proven, there's value, it's on the table, and it's happening today. Awesome. Your uh, maybe also a question for you. So what markets and VP products do you see most promising? Um, yeah, if you look at the more advanced stuff, I would say uh, 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 the, the intraday market, AFR or FCR. AFR, FCR depends a bit in what country you are in, uh, whether it's a good fit for, let's say, EVs in terms of, uh, you know, uh, data quality, uh, response to right bidding blocks. Um, Maybe just for, are, for the attendees that are not so familiar with the acronyms, can you just unpack those two a little bit? The FCR is the, the really fast stuff uh, that responds to, immediately responds to uh, uh, frequency uh, deviations on the grid. AFR is the uh, second most uh, fast product that where the TSO typically instructs you to act. Um, so they have slightly different response times which uh, and 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 meter requirements which indeed sometimes you can achieve with a wall box but might be harder with only the car connectivity and then also bit blocks and other elements might be uh, settled in a way that uh, EVs can easily fit in it or not um, but they they provide uh, substantial uh, money if you look beyond that 
Um, there are some easier things, uh, like in, in the Netherlands and Belgium, if you uh, steer passively on the imbalance signal of the TSO, you can really already make an impact without making things too complicated. So I would not always uh, urge people to look at, at, at AFR, for example, as a starter. Um, and then we see some great initiatives like the UK with DFS, the, the local markets, which are really developing really a good fit for EVs. Uh, that 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 look very promising, and we haven't seen other countries yet having these mechanisms today. But they're working on it, a bit like GoPacks and Nodes, uh, 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 moving also in that direction. Awesome, thanks. Um, maybe switching back to to the customer, uh, and I wanted to ask uh, Geert. Uh, Geert, you showed um, like a number of different tariffs, and you also indicated already what the most popular one was. But what are your thoughts on the evolution of uh, of smart charging and, and tariffs, and and do you expect it to go like into uh, fully dynamic, uh, or do you think that the the preference for a fixed rate is here to stay? I think uh, uh, at this moment uh, in Belgium, with the, the current situation, we see that dynamic tariffs. Uh, the interest is growing at the moment. Uh, but it's still uh, very much a niche product. Uh, it's uh, people uh, that are very engaged there. We have the dynamic tariff. Uh, there are not a lot of players uh, at this moment in Belgium that have a dynamic tariff, but um, we see that they are very engaged towards. They are uh, the geeky uh, kind of, uh, they develop their own solutions uh, uh, in order to steer uh, because they don't always have found uh, the necessary automation uh, to steer their uh, their heat pump or their uh, their appliances uh, and their assets in, inside. Um, we see it m a little bit moving towards uh, uh, the, the early adopters, but uh, it's still early day and it's a totally different situation. Belgium uh, today uh, where the heat pump uh, is not really subsidized by the government uh, and uh, where you see that uh, heat pumps are not really taking off in France and in the Netherlands, you see that the heat pumps are heavily subsidized and heavily pushed into the market, pushing also the need for customers to steer those. And uh, and and uh, you see that that the dynamic tariff follows that kind of evolution, I think. Uh, and since that is not the case yet in Belgium, uh, we see that people will, at the, in the in the near future, still stay in the normal type of tariffs, uh, uh, being fixed or variable. That will uh, remain in our uh, in our situation. The the well, certainly for the next year, if not more, uh, the main drivers for uh, for customers. Maybe there is a, an evolution that we will. Uh, that's what we will examine in the future. Is uh, what is uh, the, the the place of time of use tariffs? Uh, once that uh, the digital meter uh, in Flanders we have uh, a market base, but in the other regions we don't yet. So uh, there we will have to study what is the real potential. Uh, what is the difference that we can give a customer? Because in the end, it's the customer. He will choose what is uh, it gives him the benefit on his bill, huh? uh, and what gives him uh, the peace of mind uh, in the end. So uh, that's uh, that's what will, will be the driver to to move into other types of tariffs and whether they have sufficient mass potential there. Yeah, no, I totally get it. It's also like certainty versus opportunity. I know in the Netherlands. We had these uh, spats in the last uh, couple of months or over the summer where there was really negative pricing uh, or or energy for free. And the power of free is really powerful in, I think, in getting people um, over to these tariffs. Um, maybe the same question uh, on uh, uh, the evolution of, of smart charging tariffs to, to Michael uh, from a maybe a broader perspective. But what, what, what are you hearing from your customers? and? And uh, w w when you introduced your product, what, what um, yeah, what evolution do you see uh, in, in the background? So not only to keep sort of the neo smart charging function compatible with uh, you know all kinds of different uh, tariffs, I think what we do need to agree on, or as an industry work together to make sure we're pulling in the same direction, is that the cheapest hours of the day are also cheap in all of our sort of more dynamic uh, tariffs and that the high prices are the same for the high prices. Only then can we really help with the energy transition. 
how much you want to uh, protect the user from sort of spikes, uh, you know, that's up to you guys. Uh, but let's make sure that the cheapest hour, hours of the day are the same in all the tariffs. That's would be my <laughs> my wish. Great, thanks. Um, an another topic um, th that we should uh, talk about. It's not been talked about uh, so much, but it's um, it's also dear to my heart. I just moved houses, uh, and we're still in net metering here in the Netherlands. Uh, I actually have a lot of solar on my roof. Uh, so, so much that I, I didn't, I, there is no incentive for me to now switch to a dynamic tariff uh, already. Um, and, and many EV drivers have solar. Uh, maybe Thijs, you can you can talk a little bit about how you uh, are incorporating this in uh, in, in tariffs uh, and, and incentives. Like, are, are you are you talk, like this is a question with uh, I think a lot of customers in your market. What are you doing to uh, to address this? Yeah, yeah, it, it's correct. I think seventy. 60 to 70 percent of EV drivers have solar panels. Uh, well, I think in the Netherlands there is currently no financial incentive for EV drivers to to charge a car with uh, self-generated electricity, like like you mentioned yourself, because of the 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 net metering uh, scheme, eh? solderingsregeling in in Dutch. It's still in effect, but phasing out and event eventually the abolition of this scheme will likely. Be the first price incentive, I think, um, and not only affecting EV drivers uh, with, with solar panels, but also households do, who don't have an EV. Um, so, and and additionally, I had expected. So we started to research dynamic energy contracts and started to interview uh, uh, consumers. I had expected that that real time pricing uh, would be an incentive. Uh, because the prices are significantly lower when there is a high uh, when when uh, it, when there is a high solar production. L like I mentioned before, we have limited uh, experience, so so I don't have the data to substantiate it. But uh, what we have learned from these these conversations um, is uh, uh, that that people with a dynamic energy contract and 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 solar panels, they they generally don't worry about. Uh, lower prices for for the electricity that they feed back in the in the grid, and they know that there can be negative prices. And they just said, well, in cases of negative prices, we just switch off the the inverter. So, I think it's only three percent of the market now is in dynamic energy contract in the Netherlands. I think we 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 still have to learn a lot, and also the consumer has to learn a lot about what uh, dynamic rates means when you have. Uh, solar panels. So the, the the knowledge that you have, Jelle, uh, maybe I shouldn't switch to a dynamic energy contract because I have solar panels. I, th that knowledge is not broad enough uh, uh, spread. Are you actually on a, on a technical level? Are you thinking about offering that to customers, like uh, to to switch off their solar panels when prices become negative? Is that like a technical solution that that is uh, easily implementable? No, it's not easily implemented implementable because you have to to uh, do, no, you connect to the uh, inverter. But we are yeah. we are looking we are looking into that. Um, but it's it's also a little bit conflicting. Eh? So you're you're producing uh, 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 sustainable energy and then you're turning off your uh, uh, production. But we are looking into that. Yeah. And and what we have learned from from our smart charging uh, uh, customers is that there is a, a, a apart from the uh, uh, incentives or, or tariffs that that there is a need to charge your car with the the the, the solar that they produce themselves themselves not because of a financial gain but it just to prefer the, to use self generated electricity in the car. For them, it's an insurance that that the energy is genuinely uh, sustainable. Eh? The electricity from the, the 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 socket is not perceived by consumers as 100% green. Although even the the energy supplier may provide power from renewable uh, sources. So, so there's definitely a need. So also, it's an important tagline that you can use on birthday parties with your uh, with your older yeah. uncles. Um, yeah, but. Main incentives is still cost, but this is a good second one. Yeah, I totally get it. Alex, any any uh, kind of perspective from your side uh, or progress in in linking the two, like solar production at home and and, and charging directly? Many thoughts. 
um, uh, I think, um, I think, you know, if I come back to what I was saying earlier, um, there is a, there's a, like a natural tendency to think about needing to educate everyone about all of this complexity. And I'm pretty sure I could get a pretty substantial raise of hand that no one has educated themselves about how the telecom industry works and how their mobile phone works and smartphone gets data and 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 the right apps and the right amount of streaming and and, and how streaming on their phone works. Right. So I would first and foremost say like no consumers don't need to be educated to the degree that we think they do. I'd say con consumers need really compelling offers and really compelling simple solutions. I think the 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 solar and um EV charging combination is an interesting one. Um, economic, like beneficial economic outcome is very, very different per country and very crucially by size of solar system. If I look at the UK with an average solar system size of four kilowatt peak, like, sorry, but that is basically nothing for a 60 kilowatt, 100 kilowatt hour battery. Like you've basically just kind of served home load and you might trickle charge with one to two kilowatts for a little bit. But the consumer perception of I'm charging off my own power is incredible. Um, and so, you know, there's there's a there's a consumer perceived value versus an actual economic value. Now, it's very different in Germany where the average uh, residential solar system size is 10 kilowatt peak. Or if you're in Australia where you have you know, just incredible irradiation in Spain as well. Like these are, uh, these are, but these are, you know, these are the market dynamics that are different. Um, I would say that combining solar and EV charging is absolutely super compelling from a customer proposition and can be very economically beneficial, um, but it needs to be done in a super simple way. And this, I think, uh, also comes back to the previous comment about like, what's the type of tariff? And I think there's a bit of a, I'd also say there's a bit of a fallacy of this obsession of like, we need dynamic tariffs, like we need wholesale exposure and everyone needs to move to that. I would also argue that like, there is no one tariff to rule them all. There is a set of different tariffs and conditions, well, different customer groups and different segments. And those will, uh, those will actually become way broader and way bigger in the next few years and then they will reduce into like you know uh, some sort of district some sort of kind of mature distribution but i'd say we're just at the beginning of an explosion of really cool and interesting tariffs sorry i was a mood that's a good point and it's very locally dependent and also uh, uh regulatory uh dependent um and we'll talk about that in the next question. I, I am thinking, like, also as a uh, as a German, like in, in Germany, do you think it will be? It, it, that, I mean, there must be like a, a, a lot of kind of pull uh, to charge on your own solar energy, or or is that is that not something that resonates with German clients? You think more than you? No, I think it strongly resonate. It strongly resonates with 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 German clients, but also because let's be honest, there's no other economically good outcome for German clients, customers, because you've got 1% penetration of smart meters and you have 900 DSOs, most of whom have not even really begun digitizing. So Jacob made the point earlier about the long run, it's about local congestion management and because that's where all the load growth is happening. That's where all the demand is coming as we electrify transport and heating. Um, but right now in Germany, the best economic outcome is charging from your own solar because there's almost, there's, there's almost no smart charging tariff available for the, for consumers. I mean, Octopus has launched one um, uh, recently, but that is predicated on a smart meter being deployed. Yeah. Yeah. Smart meter rollout, any, uh, like, what's the fastest rate that you've seen in the UK? I, I know you have some, like, firsthand uh, visibility on this. It can go pretty quickly, uh, right? If you, if you scale that right. Yeah, I think it very much depends on the delivery model. If we look at the Netherlands and, and France um, 
and who's actually you know, mandated by government or the regulator to, to deploy smart meters is then highly correlated to, to the speed of deployment. Great. Um, maybe switching to uh, the regulatory uh, um, side, uh, like if we talk about regulatory enablers, uh, and also look around maybe Europe specifically. Uh, Jorg wanted to ask you, like, where do you see regulator, regulators getting it right, and what are some of the initiatives that you that you applaud and wish uh, would travel through Europe uh, faster? Um, so, uh, where regulators get it right is where they design products, incentives, uh, and don't don't stand in the way. A bit in line with uh, what what Michael was saying here. Eh? Make sure that the, that the tariffs or incentives are aligned, um, so that you can stack these services, make a bigger bigger impact. Now, a few of the uh, uh, I don't think the UK got it right on the smart meter rollout, but in the way they designed, for example, the DF, DFS product, their their local markets. Uh, I think the rest of Europe uh, can learn from that. Um, because these markets are really designed with taking EVs and distributed flexibility in mind, because we have seen other attempts that on paper, EVs could enter a certain product or market, but in practice, due to all kinds of small rules, uh, was really not possible. So in that sense, the UK is, uh, is definitely very interesting. When it comes to other small parts like proper smart meter infrastructure, making sure the data is, is right, that the systems are uh, easily accessible to anyone. That's where I see more like, that, that's that's more foundation, which we sometimes take for granted in perhaps the Nordic or the Netherlands. But that's where we see where some other countries still have to catch up a bit in terms of getting that right. And once that's there, any other smart charging use case gets, gets easier. Um, any countries that already enable that via like simple APIs that are, Kind of like well maintained and 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 standardized. Um, yeah. So in uh, in mm -hmm. in a way uh, uh, that's done in the Nordics already via via central hubs. Um, so that's that's in place already for a few years. Um, and also in the Netherlands, that's going quite uh, quite well and not uh, not causing any issues anymore when a utility or another player is coming up with a new solution. There's nothing blocking on that side anymore. Great, thanks. Uh, also wanted to ask the same question of regulatory enablers or disablers to Geert, since he kind of represents, I think, three countries in one. Geert, can you, uh, <laughs> can, can you maybe? I can only can talk maybe, from Belgium. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but but but, but uh, that's what I mean. It's three countries in one, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but within, it's one country, three, three, yeah. Uh, three, uh, three different regions and uh, governments and what, whatsoever. Uh, I agree. Um, what I see in in Belgium, uh, but maybe that's also a question uh, in a much broader scale, is uh, how are the governments going to solve their problem uh, that they are losing billions in taxing uh, revenues from uh, combustion cars and the gasoline and uh, etc. Uh, and uh, I think uh, they will quickly uh, come to the to the fact that oh. How can we submeter uh, the fact how you charge your cars, and can we then uh, put a ta tax on uh, on the submetered volumes? So today, those uh, volumes today uh, we don't have uh, the regulation on uh, what are the submetered uh, yeah, qualifications. Uh, is it uh, the car that uh, can deliver the data? Is it uh, the charge point that can, can deliver the data? It uh, also puts into question today that we are not able to create specific tariffs for only the charging, eh? because you all, uh, always have the home volume uh, where, where you uh, get your tariff on. Um, so I think there might be some regulation coming faster, and not maybe what we wish for, but uh, uh, due to uh, the government seeing that there is money on the table that they are losing in, in another side in Texas. That's what I think the, that in the coming years will be a question. Uh, maybe in the Nordics, the, they are already there. I don't know. Um, another element that I see is that uh, in Belgium, for cer certainly, uh, even though you have a digital meter, you are still built eh, from an energy provider 
on the, on a, ger a general curve eh, where your consumption is distributed among the months. Uh, whereas as a digital meter customer, you say, OK, you've got my uh, quarterly hour data. Why don't you bill it uh, in that way? Uh, so I think regulation will gradually come that the the customer doesn't have to ask for another billing regime, but with a digital meter, it will be standard. And this is also very important for uh, capturing as a as a supplier the flex value eh? uh, that you know that uh, the real flex value of, of a customer can be generated in that way and it's not dispersed in the market uh, in the way that it is today. Uh, another regulation element, uh, which I don't see here on the table, but uh, it's in order to have flex and to have steering, you need to be able to connect to the asset. Eh? And uh, I see a lot of uh, difficulty today in uh, openness of uh, data exchange from OEMs, whether they be uh, car manufacturers or uh, whether they be uh, charge point. Uh, I think there's a, a whole topic there where uh, regulation could come and uh, there is today something on European level uh, sharing data on the insides of the battery, etc., but not on the steering part. Eh? Uh, so there, uh, I think a lot of regulation should come in in order to enable this whole market model to function much better and broader. Any sales pitch from your side on that, Jorg? I think Jetlix has some specific solutions that could also help here, right? Yes, I'm muting. Well, obviously we help uh, players to uh, to uh, we we help parties to uh, to access uh, cars or charging station to make sure that uh, that that if you're a large energy supplier, you can reach all your clients with with these services. So that's that's part of uh, part of our toolbox. But indeed, that uh, that will be easier if there's there's more willingness to support this. Also, if and sometimes what's in it for the OEM. Uh, so obviously it's good that there might be regulations to to yeah to share this, but also what is the incentive for them to 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 help, right? Uh, so that should have a right balance, not only to uh, uh, also have a sort of carrot, not only a stick there. Um, but yeah, if people need help with access, that's uh, that's obviously where we uh, where we come in. <laughs> Maybe sidestepping a little bit, I'm also thinking about like a smart meter rollout obviously being such an important uh, part. Uh, maybe Jacob, from your side, looking at Germany uh, in introducing your tariffs, is is there a way around this, or how do how do you kind of deal with that when you're thinking about uh, uh, smart tariffs in 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 Germany? Yeah, I agree. It's it's fundamental. <laughs> it's basically yeah, our product market fit doesn't exist without smart meters. Uh, we've we've come around that at the moment with our own piece of hardware. Uh, it's called the Pulse, and we actually then have somewhat hacked uh, the slow German system. So we offer hourly tariffs and we do hourly billing in Germany without a smart meter. But clearly, uh, everything beyond that is actually partnering with other actors like Octopus and, and really poking the DSOs to get there act together yeah, it's coming in 2025 but still uh, not, not not so confident that's going to move perfectly smoothly so we need to keep pushing them essentially yeah understand okay um let's switch gears again a little bit uh maybe talk about uh, a little bit further out w when you think of um uh, the ideal or ultimate home setup uh and 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 an accompanying tariff um Alex, you, 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 can you kind of take us along a few years? Like, what, what would be the ideal setup uh, 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 be, or how would it look like? And what tariff would you, would you attach to it? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. And uh, I think you kind of uh, teased it uh, at, the, at the, your introduction. Uh, it's a zero bill tariff. And uh, and it's actually uh, it's a product that we have live today in the UK for new homes. So we work with new home builders to optimize the uh, design of the low carbon technologies in the housing development. So solar, battery, size of battery, heat pump. Um, and through managing and optimizing those, we can underwrite and guarantee five to 10 years of zero electricity bills. And they're fully electric homes, so there's obviously no gas. 
Um, so that's you know something that right now is a, a new home development um, product. Uh, with the you know the the, the first uh, the first uh, customers are living in those homes and 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 receiving a zero bill every month. Um, um, how that expands, uh, I I see that expanding um into like the what we what we would define as the retrofit so existing housing stock now that is more challenging right because you've got like every home is then different you've got thermal dynamics to like wide variation of thermal dynamics to to uh and how, how homes are heated um but uh that's in in my mind that's probably the you know the ideal home setup um an, al an alternative would be as as more devices, as more large energy consu electricity consuming devices are managed by someone, you have a systematic reduction in your kind of price. So, you know, uh, and again, this comes back to like, there's, there's so many opportunities here. It's all about how you create that proposition to customers. Like, why do we, why do we sell customers on a price per kilowatt hour for EV charging? Like, you know, what, why is that still so ingrained? Like, why aren't we selling, you know, 15,000 kilometers worth of charging per year? And like, you know, figure it out. Like, we've got, everyone has a ton of, anyone who is managing more than 20,000 or 30,000 EVs and has a, done that for, you know, more than six to 12 months should have a ton of data. So then it becomes a statistical, like, projection exercise on when are those cars going to plug in? How do I manage that risk? How do I maximize my commercial upside? Yeah, but also how do you steer people to certain times of the day uh, or week uh, when, when charging is cheaper, right? I mean, that, that is a big component of being able to offer that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but that's, you know, that's, that's, for the, that's for the consumer engagement. So we've recently launched a thing called Greener Days where um, customers can opt in to receiving a notification at the beginning of the week. Um, with a, a green score for the next six days. And, and then, you know, that's incremental and above the, you know, the smart tar tar tariff they're on. And, you know, customers love it, right? Because they, they're like, okay, cool. Well, I mean, I don't need to charge every day anyway. I mean, the average EV driver charges two and a half times per week. So, you know, suddenly you have that little bit of extra optionality. Great. Uh, Michael also wanted to ask this, the same question to you. Like the, what's the ultimate home uh, setup? It's probably so pretty ultimate, simple. Yeah, Ultimate, of course, uh, has maybe too many gadgets and a home energy manager and, and, and all that fun stuff. But for me, I think if we want to really scale, the, the limiting factor will be qualified electricians uh, for the foreseeable future. So a solution where you don't have to send an electrician for every change, something that you know you just set up in your vehicle and uh, maybe have an API with your existing solar system, uh, can really sort of take the costs out uh, and take the pain out of uh, yeah home smart home charging. So that's something I'm looking forward to some some more lower intensive uh, works. Great. Um, so I think we talked a lot about um, mobilizing. Uh, people uh, that uh, have an EV uh, and already have solar, uh, or are at least uh, uh, kind of a, a little bit further along this um, uh, like a curve of con conception. Um, maybe Thijs, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you also use these tariffs to uh, acquire EV owners that are outside of your uh, customer base? Is this a strong marketing tool for you to, to attract the, the new customers? And do you also want those customers to come to, to an ego? I, I presume, yes. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I, I assume you're referring to the requirement of EV drivers for the smart charging uh, app, yeah. Well, uh, I think EV drivers in general, uh, but but then also through, uh, through your, yeah, your um, tariff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, especially in combination with a dynamic energy contract, because there's a lot of gains for the the customers. Uh, also, well, a significant significant advantage that we have is to uh, is the ability to to leverage a network of in eco mobility. Yeah, in eco mobility uh, provides charging points and services. 
to uh, consumers and the B2B segment, uh, including leasing companies and car dealers. And customers of these B2B partners are also clients of uh, e-mobility. So that provides a, a valuable source for recru recruiting new users for the smart charging app, but ultimately also for other uh, uh, products. And uh, what we try to uh, achieve is to acquire more uh, customers for the smart charging app and 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 also and therefore um, uh, broadening uh, the, the reach. So in addition to utilizing uh, the e-mobility uh, network, we also use uh, app store optimization for, for organic growth. Um, and, and this approach enhances the uh, app's visibility in app stores uh, through optimizing uh, metadata, uh, including a description, keywords, screenshots, et cetera, et cetera. So we're still experimenting with this. And the next step in this strategy would also be to combine uh, app store op optimization with uh, Apple search ads, ads and Google app uh, campaigns. And I think the synergy from, from uh, this combined approach is it will result in a greater effect than, than using these strategies uh, separately. So as I said, we're still experimenting with this and following this uh, campaign, we will evaluate uh, and decide whether to implement uh, other uh, uh, campaigns. But I think this integrated approach, uh, combining the network advantages and app store optimization and targeted ad advertising campaigns is essential to the strategy for engaging EV users with the uh, smart uh, charging app. Yeah. Great. All right, I see uh, we're actually uh, well in, into uh, the time for this uh, webinar. Maybe I wanted to ask one ch challenging question um, uh, to a number of you. So, uh, and the question is is quite simple. Uh, maybe five, ten years from now, do you think people uh, still pay uh, per kilowatt hour, or and or do we have will still put, will people still have like real cost for their EV charging um, uh, at home? or maybe at work. Um, and and in, in kind of answering that question, maybe you can also uh, indicate which pools of value you think will be really important in that time frame, like five to 10 years in, in um, maybe dampening uh, the cost for, uh, uh, for users. Any volunteers for that question? Like, will it be for free or do we still have to pay? Alex? Um, I think it will depend on when and how urgent you need to charge. And I think in terms of value pools, wholesale market, the kind of prompt, so day ahead and intraday, um, balancing as we move to uh, a, a much more volatile balancing uh, a market uh, or like kind of reality on any in energy, uh, every energy system as it, um, as renewable generation crests above 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of the total generation mix. And then the third one is going to be the uh, the local um, DSO. So the, the low voltage congestion management and yeah. ensuring that you can defer and optimize and utilize a system that will no longer need to be built to, to, to meet peak capacity because you're ensuring a much more efficient overall utilization of the of the of the infrastructure. Yeah, we, we heard that that's already happening in the Nordics. Is that also the case in the UK? Is there like an efficient market for that already where you can where you can provide that and then get uh, compensated by uh, by DSOs? Yep, there are both uh, pre fault and post fault uh, services um, that you can. Uh, I mean, we, we hold over almost I think almost a gigawatt worth of contracts for DSOs in the UK for, that, for those services. Awesome. Michael. Yeah, I mean, will, will it be for free or will we get paid? Yeah, uh, I mean, if we just follow the trends of, you know, more renewables, uh, more uh, energy required for, for charging and heating, it's, I think it's obvious. Yes, charging will be free uh, during lunchtime in the summer uh, day, but it will definitely not be uh, for free in the winter. Uh, and uh, sort of the seasonal difference in, in also dynamic prices. I think we're, we're, we're not really talking enough 
about. And of course, that's also has a whole different uh, story for you know public charging, where you, uh, today also have you know fixed prices uh, day round uh, and year round, and and that's not going to be able to to hold up uh, in the future energy system that we're all sort of trying to work towards. To yeah. Any view on what needs to like? Do you already see some indication of where that is changing? I fully agree that that's a like that's a that's a pretty big piece of the puzzle that we still need to to cover the public the public charging. Any indications that it is done somewhere that you see? For charging, yeah, I mean you know it best. Tesla has uh, started introducing dynamic uh, pricing that's more based on sort of congestion management. I think now, but in the future, we'll also uh, reflect you know price differences between winter and summer yeah yeah i haven't seen it at any like ac charging or or let's say uh like on street charging where the car is charged or is parked longer than uh that it's charged uh, setting um but still waiting for it all right um any of the panelists on the question of five to ten years otherwise uh, yeah. i think i'm gonna wrap up with some closing remarks yeah I, jacob i can quickly say I believe charging will be free in five years and in 10 years. I, I'm yeah. one of the most skeptical people on V2G. Uh, it, it will happen, but it's a huge buzz right now and it's a bit ridiculous. But it, but in 10 years it will happen and then a vehicle is not a cost, it's a, it's a huge asset. And then you want return on investment and it's going to be earnings definitely in 10 years. Awesome. I was uh, well, one of my first closing remarks would have been that it was so refreshing to end an hour talking about this stuff without mentioning the word V2G. But uh, but you you, you <laughs> in there you have it. Uh, and by the way, I do, I do think that in in at that time frame, like if we go through the first uh, wave, um, so some of you know me as a bit of a skeptic uh, on the applicability of this. Uh, but then then definitely uh, it will uh, play a role. Um, Hey, I wanted to uh, to first of all thank uh, everybody for attending, and then also for the panelists um, uh, to share some perspectives. Uh, I think I, I I myself actually did learn a lot. I think uh, it was really refreshing to see that you all come at this uh, from a customer uh, perspective first and foremost. Uh, and whereas there is this notion that there's like a one to one match with dynamic terrorists full out, uh, it, it is also pretty clear that there are still some kind of wrapping up into tariffs that actually resonate with the market. Um, and there you see, uh, and I think Geert said it at the beginning, but it, it dawns on me that um, price certainty uh, for this market is, is also still uh, very important. So it's, it's one is that taking that opportunity to charge when the uh, uh, energy is at negative prices, that that obviously is a, is a big pull, but it might be really for a niche of the market. Most people also that have an electric car, I think they, they do want some certainty. Um, it's It was also really good to see or to hear that uh, the DSO part and the congestion part can already be wrapped up into, um, into some of the value propositions. Um, and uh, and overall, I think what, what really resonates most strongly is that we're not talking about like the future here, uh, I mean, I think Jorg, you said uh, thousands and tens of thousands. Uh, Alex talked about hundreds of thousands. Um, I think if we do this um, uh, webinar again in a year from now uh, and following the through, through exponential curve, we can talk about millions of drivers that one benefit from, from much lower cost of charging uh, and also are, are really an asset to the grid. Um, so I think, um, yeah, quite a quite a hopeful uh, hour, hour and a half that we had here. Uh, really good to see. Uh, also, thanks Jorg for, uh, and Jetlix um, for taking kind of the temperature in the market and, and, and getting everybody together. I'm sure if there's people on the call that have further questions on this uh, and want to, um, uh, to kind of uh, bounce ideas on how to get access to some of the markets uh, and to hear about some of the solutions Jetlix have, uh, Jorg and team are, are um, are ready to uh, to take those questions and to to start a conversation. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to see many familiar faces on the call. And um, yeah, thanks again. Wish you all a, a super pleasant uh, Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks.